So welcome everybody. My name is Dr. Richard Espinosa and I'm a licensed clinical psychologist based here in Los Angeles. Um, I primarily do my clinical work through seeing patients, uh, public speaking, and I'm also a researcher with the Health Inequalities Research Group. That's an independent research group based in Berkeley, California, uh, headlined by my mentor, uh, Professor Emily Diamond. And if people didn't see before, uh, just a little icebreaker in the chat box, feel free to enter if any info if you'd like. I'm just asking people's preferred name, pronouns, and maybe what their pride plans are. Uh, mine are, again, Dr. Dr. E, uh, he, him, his, el, and my pride plans so far are to see Anita at the LA's Pride in the Park this Saturday, because I love her and I'm really excited. She's crossing over to the US. Okay, so I do things pretty Socratic. So if any of you have attended my other talks or uh, my lectures, if you're a, a student or former student of mine, uh, just know both ways work. You can do the little hand emoji to ask a question. You can also just unmute yourself and ask your question, whatever it is. This will generally run till about 1.30 p.m. today um, with the understanding that the last half hour could be for questions. And if everything gets summarized and wrapped up sooner, we can definitely wrap up sooner too. So my intention overall, this is part two of my Summer Pride series, a series of free talks I plan to give um, for the community, uh, mostly addressing concerns specific to the LGBTQ plus community and also developing strong allyship skills uh, to those who aren't within the community. But what I always emphasize is in the queer al alphabet of all the letters, one of the A's does stand for ally. So if you identify as an ally to the queer community, surprise, you're in the queer community. You are a part of the alphabet. So let's begin. And I usually do this with a clicker in hand, so forgive me if the slides take some time. So just to preface, my slides, if I do slides, tend to be very text heavy. Um, so feel free to look these over, but I'm also going to be talking, you know, the gist of what my slides have. So today's talk, you know, playing it straight, what is straight acting and how could it harm or help is part two in my series, of my Summer Pride series. The previous talk was let's talk about coming out. Upcoming after this in a few weeks is going to be um, addictive habits, um, exploring our dependence on spending, sex and substances. For this one in particular, we're gonna go over straight acting. So we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of what this phenomenon is. So starting off, who is this talk for? So from a Gallup poll, by um, a periodical based in DC, very reputable. As of 2021, 7.1% of the US population adults identified within the LGBTQ plus or queer community. So that means we have on average, if we do some math and round up, we have about 25 million queer folks in this country, which also means we have around 305 million potential allies. So who's this talk for? It's for all of you and anyone else who you feel could benefit from this. And let me also begin by clarifying my terminology. If I say LGBTQ+, LGBTQQIAA, the number two, any of that, it's all an umbrella term. Queer is also an umbrella term that's been reclaimed in recent years. It's received a bit of pushback, but if I say LGBTQ+, queer, or GSM, I'm talking about the same populations. GSM is the terminology that the National Institute of Health started using in recent years, and that just stands for gender and sexual minorities, because you're technically a minority if you're only in 7.1% of a greater 100% population. So is everybody clear with the terminology? Any questions on that first off? Okay, anyone feel like they don't belong here? Hopefully not. Okay, so let's start off with the ugly and what has motivated me to give these free webinars uh, this summer. I'm having personal and professional reactions to the litany of anti-queer laws and regulations being headlined in this country. Uh, as of last year, the Human Rights Campaign, or the HRC, they cited over 266 anti-queer bills under consideration. So some of those ugly examples are the no promo homo laws, 
in, I want to say, up to eight states. Uh, that's Utah, Arizona, Texas, Oklahoma, Louisiana, Missouri, Alabama, and South Carolina. The no promo homo laws, and that's actually what they call them, uh, were instituted, I want to say, about six years ago. And these are gag rules, meaning they limit what schools can speak on regarding LGBTQ matters in class. Initially, this started with health classes. So the teachers weren't allowed to discuss uh, queer matters and non-heterosexual sex in health classes. And then this trickled into every other subject. So English classes, history classes, et cetera, in these states are not allowed or gagged, not allowed to talk about queer topics. Uh, furthering on, governors and a few other states went farther and instituted athlete bans, meaning transgendered identified athletes are not allowed to play in the gender in the gender leagues that they identify with. And Arkansas went a little harder, and they're even considering uh, just banning gender medicine for minors altogether. So lots of pushback from from those that don't support us. Ooh, my bad. I think most people have heard about the don't say gay bill in Florida, which is awful. It's similar to the no promo homo laws or the gag rules. It's you can't talk about queer topics in, in uh, public schools. And then if people haven't heard about the recent one, Texas, their governor proposed a ban on minors attending drag shows. I believe he called them um, perverted performers or something to that effect. But we don't know her. So this is what we're up against. And these reasons alone in this country have motivated me to do my best to conduct research on the queer community and disseminate all that I've gathered from it and try to make it in a affordable, accessible format, such as these talks. Any questions or comments on the anti-queer laws under consideration? Okay. And more fun to the game. The, the pandemic and its impact on queer persons. So taken straight from the Movement Advancement Project, uh, their, their digest noted that LGBTQ households are more likely than non-LGBTQ households to experience job losses, serious financial problems, issues accessing to care, and so on as a result of the pandemic. These issues are exacerbated if one belongs to Black or Brown communities, especially in the American South. So... The pandemic did a lot of things, including making it hard to be queer in this country. Fun stuff. But I promise it does get better. It'll just take a little more time in this conversation. So today's topic, what is straight acting? Straight acting, in my opinion, is inauthentically adjusting one's behaviors. So for example, your voice, your mannerisms, your way of dress, etc to fit stereotypical gender roles that are congruent with the assigned sex to pass as non-queer. And it's a multifaceted topic, so much that it gets its own lecture. Some of the ways that straight acting can manifest is taking the form of pretending straight out to be heterosexual, pretending to be cisgendered, uh, being neutral on the matter, or having to be homophobic or homonegative when knowingly still identifying within the queer community. So it's, it's important, important people that uh, the queer community typically care about their opinions, especially when coming out, tend to be physicians, their medical providers, employers, coworkers, siblings, old romantic partners, especially if they were passing for straight and dated people of the gender they actually weren't attracted to, um, parents in particular and family, and um, it, it goes on. Of my clinical observations, it sounds like people's primary caregivers or parents often are the most significant relationships that people um, are concerned about being authentic towards. This is, can be in coming out or just acting as the gender they believe in or such. Again, it always comes back to the parents. The primary caregivers typically hold the most significance in our mind when it comes to revealing and authentically being our identity, whatever it is. Any questions so far? 
Okay, I'm also noticing it's really keeping me only on a few faces and it's not shifting them out. So if anyone's doing the uh, hand raise emoji, I'm not gonna see it. So just feel free to unmute yourself and ask whatever question or say whatever comment. Okay. So straight acting. From a psychoanalytic or psychodynamic stance, the ego defenses at play could be called denial, splitting, or reaction formation. For those who aren't a psychoanalyst, ego defenses are the ways that our mind protects itself. Um, in modern language, we call this coping, coping mechanisms. So the ego defenses or coping mechanisms at play, sometimes when, when it comes to straight acting, can be denial, straight up, straight up denying that there's anything to address, splitting, viewing things as all good or all bad, all black, all white, all heterosexual, all queer, and reaction formation. Reaction formation is that more complicated one where sometimes people do the opposite to what they're feeling. And in this case, many people who feel authentically queer may not behave as such. They may do the opposite to, in order to reconcile with their mind that they feel different but they want to still fit in. So they're going to do the opposite of what their feelings tell them to do. Uh, from a psychoanalytic stance, this can be taken from Donald Winnicott's false self disorder. And just to be very brief on what that is, the false self disorder theorized by Winnicott is when a young one can't let their hair down or can't be themselves or dedicates a lot of their mental energy as a young, as a youngling, to minding their parents or to holding the emotions of their parents or just taking on the role that a child shouldn't in general. When a kid can't authentically be themselves, Winnicott theorized that we develop a false self. And that can, in this context, be translated to a straight acting or straight passing persona. The adaptive skill of straight acting, it can be explained as a necessity. So, Many proto-queer children, meaning they're about to identify as queer, uh, couldn't be themselves for fear of rejection, abuse, or ostracism. When you think about it, when we're children, we are completely dependent on the people who raise us and our primary caregivers or our parents or our family of origin. We're completely dependent on them. So if we, at our core, maybe suspect we're a bit different, the first thing that kid is going to do is try to align their values with their family at large so that they're not kicked out or they're not othered or scapegoated or treated any other way. So straight passing also tends to favor stereotypically gendered binary. Usually masculine is kind of the goal from what I observe, especially with my clients. Behaving more masculine, even if in your heart of hearts you don't feel that masculine or you don't present as masculine on the outside, it's still masculine tends to be more favored than feminine currently. Is that making sense? Anyone have any questions on the false self and how that could be applied to queer kids? Okay, great. So what are the costs of this inauthenticity and falsehood? So living inauthentically can lead to, well, a multitude of things. Uh, first and foremost, as I've mentioned, it can lead to developing a false persona, being a fake version of yourself that one can sometimes turn on or simply falls into. Being forced or choosing to behave inauthentically and straight act, it reinforces lowered self-esteem and poor image, poor self-image. Um, it can go on to instill fear, hyper-awareness, or vigilance towards being outed. So one of the number one concerns I hear when people talk about holding a big secret or holding, uh, withholding a piece of their identity, it's the fear of it being acknowledged, found out, or someone else putting it out on the table. So the cost of uh, inauthenticity can also lead to anxious symptoms, depressive symptoms, and particularly with anxiety symptoms, it could be excessive worry, negative self-talk, and again, poor self-image. It's always so sad talking about these topics, leading with them. Uh, inauthenticity also then sometimes enables self-aggression and self-hatred. Also, it allows you know, outward, overt aggression and hatred towards others. 
And again, you'll see that when we talk later about people who are homo negative, which I'll explain more, who tend to bash queer people knowingly, even unconsciously, that they are queer themselves. Um, also, some of the costs of being inauthentic, not being yourself in the queer community can lead to symptoms of post-traumatic stress. Um, there's a high incidence of femme shaming and mask praising um, throughout all genders too. It still seems just from my observations that still masculine is still the ideal. Even like, for example, in like lesbian communities, it's still being, being the more um, butch or stud member of like a partnership or a group. <sighs> also the sad stuff. So queer, queer teens are two to three times more likely to attempt suicide. And I don't have the stats off the top of my head, but queer teens are also more likely to complete suicide because there's a huge difference as the clinicians in the audience will know between suicide attempts, suicidality, which is passive and suicide completion, which is active, active suicidality. So of my clinical observations that I've seen from my caseload and the wonderful people who've been willing to put their mind in my hands, it's definitely a difficulty finding their tribe, their kinfolk, making queer friends and finding partners. I mean, if you're pretending to be heterosexual, I mean, people clearly aren't gonna think, oh, that's a gay person I can date or such. Um, homo negativity, which I'll get to here, it's the, it's internalized heterosexism that goes awry. So I'll probably explain this on the next slide. So we have homophobia, which I feel is a bit, mis, bit, bit of a misnomer. Homophobia sounds like it's the fear of anything queer, but it's actually really the hatred of anything queer. Uh, homophobia, uh, internalized homophobia, which is when queer people somewhat agree with, not even knowingly, that anything queer is not good or bad or that heterosexual is the gold standard. That's where we bleed into heterosexism. Heterosexism is the understanding that heterosexual is the norm and it is the gold standard and it's what we should pursue. Then we get to homonegativity where it's gone even farther down the rabbit hole where queer people actually believe all of this nonsense. They believe that being queer is bad. They believe that heterosexual is good. And that's again where that term reaction formation comes out. They do the opposite. Instead of being authentic, they lean into the inauthenticity and actually pose aggression towards those who live authentically. Also, one of my other clinical observations is it leads to a lack of observation. If you don't like yourself, how on earth do you expect to educate yourself on your identity? So I see lots of barriers to the straight acting persona many queer people are forced to adopt at times. Any questions or comments on the negative? Okay. Okay, there can actually be some benefits to straight acting, okay? At the end of the day, our defenses or our coping mechanisms are our mind's best attempt at helping us out. It just doesn't always do it in the most effective way. It tries to do it in the quickest way, but not always the healthiest way. So some of the benefits, and taken straight from uh, most of my caseload, they, if you reframe it, they get, they get to develop code switching skills. So queer code switching is the ability to speak in you know, queer vernacular with your girls, and then to be able to make sense towards the heterosexual community. And girls is just the little no more I'm using for that. Um, so some people do frame it as, hey, I get to learn basically a new dialect. I get to learn how to speak gay and speak straight. And if that works, that works. Because social intelligence is a necessary skill that queer people usually are forced to develop. Um, it's a necessary skill to kind of understand your surroundings, understand as quickly as you can the minds of the people you're interacting with and basically telling ourselves, is this person cool? Is this person not? So it's that, it's that hyper awareness, that, that vigilance I mentioned earlier. And especially if someone is trying to fly under the radar, developing this code switching skills is going to be necessary. Um, one example of this developed uh, skill set is gaydar. And there's actually a wealth of research on gaydar. And that's the ability to perceive someone's queerness by listening to their voice, looking at their mannerisms, or looking at their face. 
One scary example, in my opinion, it's, I'm forgetting the year it was published, but um, recently Stanford University uh, came up with an algorithm that with 92% accuracy can tell if someone is queer just based off their Facebook profile picture. That, that raises a lot of question marks. Can that be helpful? Can that be harmful? I mean, just one example um, in my dive into the research was a recent case where an individual was seeking asylum from their country of origin. Their country of origin had harsh anti-queer laws and their attempt at seeking asylum was, you know, well, if I stay in my country of origin, I'm gonna be murdered for my queerness. Their attorney was able to use that algorithm to demonstrate that, yeah, this mathematical algorithm determined that this person's queer. My client is also saying they're queer, therefore let's grant them asylum. So it's, it's that double-edged sword. If, if we can now quantify and ha have supercomputers tell if we're queer or not, I mean, that's a lot of power to hold. Um, some of the other benefits of straight acting can be forming protective relationships. Uh, these used to be called beards, um, mostly geared towards gay men who would partner with women um, who either did or did not know of their uh, true queer identity. And this was their beard, I guess, something to make them appear more masculine, and they would fly under the radar. Uh, this was very common, um, especially just taken from my case out of people in the 70s and 80s. Also, during the AIDS epidemic at its height, you will find that a lot of people that survived the epidemic uh, did so as such by being in these protective relationships or having a beard. Fun stuff. So some of the other benefits, which I'm really grasping at straws, trying to highlight the positives, uh, you might actually receive, if one is successfully straight passing or straight acting, they may see uh, receive microaggressive praise for straight passing in both personal and in professional settings. So oftentimes, you know, sentiments can be heard like, oh, you don't look gay or you don't sound gay. Intended, I guess, to be a compliment, but mm, I mean, we'll see down the road, it kind of reinforces this falsehood. But however, in the moment, it's that instant gratification. It's like, yes, you pass for straight, you're good. So some people do view that as a benefit of straight acting or straight passing. Dr. Uh, yes. I just want to let you know, you have a question in the chat. Oh, wonderful. Thank you. Please move chat. There we go. Could you say you created the algorithm or the Stanford Center? Yes, I, I can share that after. Um, I can't off the top of my head right now, but it was through Stanford University. And it's in my citations later, but thank you for the question. Oh, okay, thank you for that share. I'm just reading from the comments. Uh, we have a share from Musa. Um, to be truly honest, I, tr I totally manipulate my gender expression depending on the social context. And that has proven extremely beneficial to me as opposed to my friends who are unable to. So yeah, that's, that's one uh, slight privilege of being able to code switch, queer code switch and navigate circles. So thank you for that share, Musa. Um, we also see this in the Seeking Mask for Mask and that's taken right out of uh, hookup culture, uh, particularly queer male hookup culture. Uh, the benefits, if someone presents as masculine, that tends to be praised in the gay male community. And so it may be a badge of honor for some people. So there are some arguable benefits to straight passing. And like with the one with Musa just shared, it enables one to navigate different circles almost seamlessly. And now we'll just check for any more comments. Okay. Yeah, uh, thank you, Musa. In terms of preferential treatment, so you're able to receive preferential treatment, special treatment for being able to code switch as such. And also what Musa noted, not all of his friends and counterparts can actually do that. Okay. Oh, great. You guys are very active. Thank you. Okay. So part of my clinical work is helping people understand what straight acting is understand what possible barriers it may prove to their authenticity and their ability to just live authentically and just have a better mental health. And it begins by acknowledging, exploring, accepting, and then adjusting as we go forward. 
So ways that this can be adjusted are to, first and foremost, like I just said, explore and identify any inauthenticity in one's queer identity. And this could take years of therapy. It could take weeks of therapy. Uh, it says as willing as the person is to adjust just and reformat their identity. Next, we need to appreciate where this straight acting has been helpful in life. So it's as easy as just asking, how has it benefited you? Um, so like, for example, he's not, but if Musa was my client, I would explore that right there. And I would probably hear the example that, yeah, it's helped me get preferential treatment and just appreciate where it has helped you. Up next, we acknowledge where it has been praised or reinforced. And that's just as easy as exploring the person's history, um, getting them to acknowledge, because it's not like while they're sitting on your couch, they're immediately gonna like think of all the Rolodex of memories that have helped them, but it helps plant that seed for them to acknowledge where straight acting or straight passing has maybe helped them. Um, we then make efforts to explore and try to understand where it's made barriers in one's identity and development. And then once that phase in therapy or in just holding space or support for our loved ones, because you don't have to be a therapist to support someone through this process, we provide resources, support, and accountability in executing whatever the plan is, whether it's a treatment plan per se, or it's just a person's plan to live more authentically, or maybe even come out if that's holding them from coming out. Um, we need to then understand situational straight acting may still happen. And what I mean by that is, uh, it's like an example I used in my uh, last talk a few weeks ago. Let's say someone is out of the closet, out and proud. They are living as authentically as possible. Let's say, for example, that individual is going on a business trip and they're with an opposite gendered partner or a differently gendered par um, business partner out on that business trip. Let's say the two of them are sharing a room at a hotel. They walk up to the concierge and the concierge goes, oh, sir, you and your wife are gonna love this room or something to that effect. In that little moment, one could argue that they were just put back into the closet. And one has the choice. Do they assert their authenticity? And do they say, no, I'm a gay man. This is my colleague and we are not gonna be having sex or something like that. You could, a person could also just let it pass. And those are those little moments of benign, um, I'm trying to think of the word right now, those little passive moments where inauthenticity kind of slips under the radar. I'm not telling people to get on their soapbox every time that these moments happen, but they are a thing. So it's always good to remind people that you can be as authentic as you want. Doesn't mean the world is going to pin that on you or understand that immediately when you walk in the door. And taken straight from Patricia Ruby Powell, in time, once someone learns to become more authentic, accepts where it's helped them, accepts where it has hurt them, and accepts places in life that, or situations in life where this may rise again, that's where we start to give back or to associate this to like Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. It's that transcend, or no, um, yeah, it is, it's, Maslow. It's that transcendence when we give back or help others, which helps both help someone else and in turn reinforce our development. Lifting as you climb. So as one becomes more authentic and starts to enjoy and maybe even love their queer identity, that's when it's time to start helping others, whether it's just holding space for them, providing support, answering a 3 a.m. text from one of your queer you know, friends that's less developed, and, and so on. Is this all making sense, everybody? Any questions, comments, anecdotes? Okay, great. So some of the interventions that I've done, um, just throughout my decade of working with queer people, I've devised a lot of things into digestible formats for people. So. With my research, um, I like to digest them into psychotherapy worksheets, which can be used on the client by themselves, or they can be used with the support of a loved one, or they can be used by a psychotherapist who doesn't feel as well versed in queer concerns. Um, so my worksheets, my upcoming workbooks, or um, just the, the freebie meditative videos, um, all of my clinical work and research has been digested into these digestible formats for persons. And info on these will be provided at the end. 
Okay, so a big topic, and trust me, we'll get to allyship soon. What if you are a queer clinician or just a queer person uh, experiencing your own triggering or uh, response to your queer clients or queer people you're holding space for? Well, first and foremost, remember that parallel process, which is for people who are not therapists, parallel process is when the client's matters start activating our own matters. And this could be good or bad, um, but it, it can prove blind spots. If you fully align and identify with the client's concerns, well, there's possibility for collusion. There's a possibility that there could be blind spots because the two of you think you're so synced up, there could be other things in the therapy that aren't being addressed. So that's what parallel process is. But again, you don't have to be a therapist to experience this. Your own issues, traumas, or just concerns can also be reactivated while holding space and listening to someone else that you're trying to support. So these are some reminders and tips for that experience. So just a reminder to the clinicians and everybody, everything we talk about with our clients has a potential for parallel process. One could be living with ADHD, uh, medicated and fine, but can be working with a client that's realizing that they have attention deficit and walking them through what medication management will look like and walking them through processes maybe you went through yourself. So most things we talk about have happened. Or let's say we're working with a client or you're just holding space for someone who lost a parent. Many of us have lost parents ourselves. And so that parallel process always has had the potential to rear its ugly head. So remember that self-disclosure falls under multicultural and humanistic approaches. So just remember that psychotherapy is an intimate relationship that always still remains professional. It's a, it's a strange dance we play while we're holding professional boundaries while also talking about very personal and intimate matters with people. It is, and pe some people don't like to hear this, but therapy is, it's a one-sided um, relationship. It's, sorry, people can hear that, it's really loud. Uh, it's a one, it is a one-sided relationship and it differs from friendship. The difference between therapy and friendship, it's friendship it involves a certain reciprocity where one person speaks, the other person speaks, and sometimes it's one person speaking, waiting for the other person to stop talking so they can interject. Therapy is different and holding space for people is different. It's suspending the self while we let someone else go through something while we uh, hold them, metaphorically. So for clinicians that may experience parallel process, remember, consult with your own treatment, I personally feel all psychotherapists need their own psychotherapy to help them stay afloat. And we help each other out with a network. Uh, always defer to your clinical supervisors or your own emotional support groups, which can be very helpful. Um, avoid interventions that may receive feedback such as, um, when you opened up about that Dr. Smith, I wasn't sure who was the therapist and who was a client in the session. And what I mean by this, this is sometimes the number one feedback I hear concerning specifically queer matters. When a queer clinician is working with a queer individual, sometimes that over-identification leads to therapy kind of feeling like it's just friendship. The therapist may um, relax some boundaries and it's in those moments where they say, mm, I don't know who was the therapist and who was a client in that situation. And I don't really know if that was therapy per se. So as a clinician, just do your best to avoid those moments. I mean, again, remember that it's intimate yet professional always. Uh, for specifically to the therapist, remember to always clarify roles and clarify the therapeutic frame as needed. So you can say, you know, we're about to explore what coming out will be like. We're about to maybe set up a plan and assess if, it, if you're ready to come out. Yes, I had a coming out experience too, but don't let my experience influence yours. From a humanistic stance, maybe we can share what our experience was like, but with the healthy knowledge that our experience is still not going to be what plays out for that person as well. So as always, just always clarifying roles and the frame. And this always helps develop the rapport. Um, do any of the clinicians in the audience, in the virtual audience, have anything? Okay. Does anyone disagree? I'll, just, I'll add something. If you can, this is yes. Joe. Hi, sorry. Um, I'm kind of scrambling around, so I don't want my video to be weirdly distracting. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, like one thing that I found to be helpful, I was like, because obviously in the therapy room, things 
can be, um, you know, there can be a lot of things happening um, that you're tracking. And so a, a simple reminder for myself um, regarding self-disclosure that I found helpful is asking myself, like, who's, whose needs are being met by this disclosure? Like, and it, it can include my needs as a therapist as well, but it has to be centrally focused on, on the client, of course. Um, and, and certainly not at the exclusion of the, of the client. It can't be like just, you know, indulging my own need to talk about something about me for the sake of itself or something like that. Wonderful. Thank you, Joe. I very much echo that. Always asking yourself, what is my drive to share this with somebody? Is it personal? Is it ego driven that I just want to share my cool story? Or is it maybe I want to share so that it could let someone know that, you know, things get better or, you know, all of us have gone through this, you know, ask yourself that. So thank you, Joe. I completely agree with that. And then specific to therapists, it should always be discussed what happens if you run into each other out in the real world. Because if you're a queer clinician, we're part of a smaller, you know, 7.1% of the population community, there's bound to be overlap out in the real world. And I don't know about the other clinicians in, in the attendance, but clients tend to hate running into you in the real world, unless there's certain pathologies that, you know, where they want to cross boundaries from the get-go, usually psychotherapy clients do not like running into their therapist in the real world. It's kind of like seeing your teacher when you're in grade school. So it's always good from the beginning, especially because we identify, we're part of a small community, again, where there's bound to be overlap. I've run into clients so many times. Um, it's good to clarify the APA standards that, you know, confidentiality extends outside of this space instead of the, vir outside of the virtual office and the physical office. So our first bet is to not acknowledge. So if I, I always tell people directly, if I see you out in public, know that I'm not ignoring you. It's just policy for me to not acknowledge. You as the client hold privilege and you can come up to me and say hi as much as you want. That's totally fine. You can out yourself as like my patient, but just know I'm never gonna overtly out you as my patient and I'm not really gonna engage with you too much. So I'm not gonna be like, you can't like offer me a shot or something or something to that effect. Like it, it, you're not gonna hang out with them out in the real world. And it's good to clarify this because queer events that we may attend, you know, for example, pride festivals, AIDS life cycle, AIDS walk, dyke march, and you know, other queer spaces. So always good to clarify that and set those parameters and boundaries from the get go. Do any of the other clinicians have any <laughs> feedback on that or anecdotes? I will never forget the time I ran into a group client in the shower at the gym. So it's always good to talk about those boundaries beforehand. <laughs> Terrifying. Yeah, this is like 12 years ago now. Okay. How to ally. Okay. This extends to heterosexual or allied clinicians and just straight people in general. This is kind of the meat and potatoes. I'm always asked, like people always say, okay, be a good ally. Okay. How? So reminder, so long as you want to hold space, support, or challenge homophobia, you are an ally. And the following are some tips. And this is the dynamic list. So if people from the audience want to interject or give me their advice or maybe their opinion or critique on some of these things, please feel free. I'm always learning. So if this were in person, we'd do an experiential, but that's not going to happen. So the, exper the experiential would be having your heterosexual allies in attendance agree to hold, find, a, find a partner for this hold hands with someone of the same gender they present as and take a lap around the block. Holding hands around just one block will really let you know what it's like to be queer and for it to be put out there. And you always hear people have certain reactions still, but that's not happening here. Um, start small. And this comes directly from Dr. Uh, Mastansky from Northwestern, a uh, great guy. Uh, advocate for gender inclusion on demographic forms. So if you really want to be an ally, maybe the next time you go to the doctors or you fill out any type of form and they ask for, oh, what's, what's your sex? Male, female, and that's it. 
if you don't see something that's inclusive to the queer community, maybe just bring it up. Just say, hey, Dr. So-and-so, uh, I was just noticing on this demographic form that you know, there's nothing for non-binary, there's nothing for gender non-conforming, trans, just little things like that help develop one's advocacy. Because always remember, being an ally, it's a process. It's a skill, it's a skill set to develop. So you're not going to feel 100% like an ally from the beginning. It, it'll take pro a process of years, in my opinion. Um, as an ally, begin to normalize the topic in everyday conversation. Uh, just talk about queer issues, ask people if they're going to Pride, ask to go to Pride, things of this sort. Um, when you're talking in a group of people, um, maybe state your pronouns, maybe note that you're heterosexual, uh, maybe note that you're, if you're, uh, you know, cisgendered male, note, note that, oh, you know, I date women and blah, blah, blah. Like, I date women, I went on a date last week, and she was, etc. Just normalizing that it's okay to be outside of the binary. Um, some more ally tips, you know, ask your queer loved ones if they plan to date or are actively dating and get comfortable using the pronoun of the genders that they are attracted to. So if you have a friend who you know is a lesbian, ask them if they're dating any women and say, you know, what was the date with her like or things like that. Just again, normalizing the situation. Concerning the dating world too, as allies, uh, I hear this all the time, so I had to put it on my slide. Decrease the use of the word, words like friend, when you know it's someone that they're romantically or sexually interested in. So little friend, or um, how's your friend doing? Or, oh, this is my daughter's friend. If you know darn well that they are not their friend, and it wouldn't embarrass them, meaning that maybe they've been dating a couple weeks, so they can't really say partner or girlfriend yet. Outside of that, you know, Try not to, try to limit the use of friend when you know darn well they're not their friend. They're not just a friend. Um, as an ally, get comfortable asking to attend queer spaces and acknowledge always that you're a guest. Yes, you are a warmly welcome guest in queer spaces, but you're not the special guest star. I hear that feedback all the time from my queer clients and just queer friends. Showing up doesn't mean you get to be the grand marshal of the pride parade. It just means you get to participate in the pride parade. I have a question on that, Richard. Yes. Um, when you see that happening, when someone is centering themselves in a space that they clearly should not be, like they're taking too much space, right? Um, do you have any tips for calling that person out? Okay. Let's, mm. <laughs> this one gets hot debate. This one gets hot debate. I'm just going to use the example of bachelorette parties at gay bars. Yes. Oh my gosh. Yes. That's the exact scenario. Okay. Okay. I see a lot of people's eyes opening. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Here we go. Um, for context, can you maybe describe what that egregious behavior would be? Yeah. I mean, um, I'll, I'll just I'm gonna I let an ally say it. Not <laughs> I can't. Um, I can't think of like a concrete example off the top of my head, but I think like like straight folk can get into this like terrible. Um, what do I want to say? Um, tangent where they want like trauma porn. They want like, hey, can you tell me about your your coming out experience? Or can you like they go there, or they they ask these really like personal questions and it's like hey we're we're clubbing for pride right now or whatever it's like this is one it's not the time or place two it's not you shouldn't ask that question mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. and then three if they do get that story they will then be like oh it reminds me of a time and then they insert something very insignificant of like when i was at roadhouse and this thing happened to me and it's like no that's a restaurant thing like excuse <laughs> me no what are you doing this is like not okay and when you're watching that happen, like you're watching, you're watching your, someone you love, like their heartbreak in front of you and you want to be there for them, but you also want to like, like, you know, um, do bad things to the other person. <laughs> like you just want to protect your friend, but clapbacks, um, is, is typically what I feel is like my response personally. Mm -hmm. And I feel like that will feel more hate, you know? Okay. Because then it's kind of like, oh, like the person that centered themselves, it's like, oh, did it was my experience not bad? And it's like, yeah, it might have been bad, but like you just 
you just took someone's trauma and you, you put it on, or, or, you know, you made this like false equivalency of this experience to your experience. And that wasn't the time or place to do it. It's, I mean, you should never center yourself. You should never take up too much space, but calling somebody out can be tricky Mm -hmm. because then you don't want that person to hate the person you're protecting. If that makes sense. Get comfortable with sitting in discomfort as an ally. (laughs) Queer people inherently sit in discomfort and get comfortable with that. Yeah. Uh, Addressing the particular situation you suggested, um, I'm drawing this just directly from narcissistic defense. So if someone is acting narcissistically towards you, Mm. one of the easiest clapbacks is, or just responses is, why do you feel it's okay to put me on the spot? Or why do you feel it was okay to ask me that? Why do you feel it was okay to say that to me just now? So that could be adapted to this situation as, why do you feel it was okay to ask me something so intimate and personal in front of all these people? Okay. Okay. So you're kind of making them think about what they just did. So it's not really like an attack on them or they don't feel like it's an attack. It's more of a, please clarify. Yeah. Uh, Always when you get someone to clarify their inappropriate question, it usually diffuses it because they have to repeat it out loud. The dumb thing they just said. Got it. Uh, Or, but yeah. Yeah, because I mean, in, in those situations, sometimes I feel like then, like say that w- say that was a situation uh, and, and you now have two friends that are arguing and the person who just shared the story is the one that's being ignored. So it's like, okay, this, that's not the, that's the situation I'm trying to avoid personally because yeah, like that's, that's not the point. Like you don't want too many people taking up too much space where they shouldn't. Mm-hmm. One thing I would also suggest to the queer person, if this happens to, if this aggression happens towards them, again, maybe the stance of why do you think it was okay to ask me something so personal here? Um, If someone's a bit sassy, you can counter with an equally personal question of how'd you lose your virginity (laughs) or something like that, which isn't always a positive story for people too. So it's just as ripe with potential trauma porn as the term you used. I like that. Um, I haven't heard that. (laughs) Yeah. I don't know if it's a real thing. It's just, it's just what I use um, to describe it. Cause that's what it feels like. Honestly, it's like, why do you need to know? Why is this even valid to our friendship? Mm -hmm. This is stupid. Also um, microaggressions, aggressions, and uh, just affronts to people usually come from a place of privilege that can be crosswalked again to dealing with people who are narcissistically inclined or defended. So another thing taken from narcissistic defense is also concrete answers. So if someone were to ask you directly, what was coming out like? You could just say traumatic, just a concrete solid answer or (laughs) really uncomfortable. Thank you for bringing that up. Or if it was great, you can still acknowledge, you know, this is a volatile topic to bring up to people. My experience was positive, but I want you to know this before I continue. Or you can be sassy and say, you know, I'm not here for your entertainment for your trauma porn, I guess. Someone please Google that and let me know if (laughs) that that exists. I don't know if that's a great idea. (laughs) Yeah, never mind. Thank you. Oh, oh, geez. Yes. Yeah. I just thought about that. I just thought about that (laughs) Thank you. You might get some weird stuff popping up. I'm just kidding. (laughs) It's academic. It's scholarly. I promise. I think, uh, you know, I just want to say, I think, um, to there are it's all about perspective too so I think for that person asking those questions that sometimes you know them being uncomfortable and not knowing how to react or what to say is another you know thing to consider so it's a it's a difficult it's a tricky that's a slippery slope <laughs> yeah yeah because it's it's one of those things like I said sometimes I feel like when and I've seen, I've actually seen this a lot, not in this space in particular, um, where what, if you do confront the person that's asking that wrong question, it justifies like, and this is why I can't hang out with X group. And it's like, no, no, no. You just need to learn how to, how to act. Basically. That's it, yeah. Yeah. And it's like, I'm trying to teach you and you now feel shame. Like, tell me why you feel shame. Oh, maybe that's what, oh, maybe that's one I can follow up with. Yeah. Yeah, we call that a probing question. Probing question. Okay. Mm-hmm. Probing. 
Yeah, so thank you. Um, continuing on with this, thank you for everybody's engagement. Um, it helps me <laughs> feel like I'm not just talking to a blank screen. Um, also, be aware, this came up with my last talk. Uh, and it's met, met with mixed reviews. So sent, so if someone like discloses something personal about their queer identity or comes out to you or such, sentiments such as I always knew or I always suspected, it's often met with mixed reception. Even if the person was as gay as Christmas and then finally came out to you, so you did always know, still, it's much more affirming just to take it and say, okay, wow, thank you for sharing this with me, rather than saying, I always knew. Because that's kind of the microaggression of like, oh, I still know you're different. I always knew you were different. I also am aware, um, I've recently discovered that microaggression is also maybe being phased out of our profession. Um, it tends to qualify certain things as mini traumas versus substantial traumas. So apologies for my use of microaggression. It's just what's been conditioned into me, but I, I do plan to evolve my language as time moves on. Have any other clinicians heard about that shift from using microaggression to just um, aggression, aggressive moment? No? Okay. Okay. All right, moving on with allyship. More. So regarding someone's queer status or even coming out, asking affirming, wait, my bad. Uh, so asking questions such as how do you identify or what was coming out like for you or would you be willing to share something about this experience that open-ended questions gives a person a chance to confirm their status or their identity while waiting for, the, for them to disclose their queer status or something about their identity gives them a chance to affirm their identity so choose accordingly between those two. Neither is good nor bad, just acknowledge the stance you're taking. So if you directly inquire about something about somebody, that again, allows them to confirm whatever you've been wondering or suspicious about. If a person on their own volition opens up to you and reveals something about themselves that they expect and trust you to hold, that allows them to affirm something about them. So both are helpful, just again, choose accordingly. And always acknowledge asking yes or no black or white questions, it comes from a place of privilege. So it's kind of like, are you Mexican? Are you gay? Are you trans, etc. Those are very pointed, privileged ways of asking something. Also, true to uh, what Joe shared earlier, ask yourself why you're so motivated to ask this person something about them. Is it a way to help enable them or hold space for them? Or is it to confirm something or win a bet or something like that? Just ask yourself where this curiosity is coming from. For our allied clinicians, you can consider try starting therapy with stating your pronouns or your sexual orientation. Um, I know it probably feels strange at first, and especially if someone's coming from a more uh, bounded approach like psychoanalysis or such, uh, you know, this sounds completely absurd. However, if queer people have to acknowledge their sexuality, heterosexuals should be held accountable for the same, in my opinion. Um, opening with your pronouns and maybe your sexual identity, sexual orientation identity, it's definitely rooted in experiential, humanistic, and uh, just more... Um, client-centered interventions. So it facilitates a therapeutic frame from a place of collaboration, in my opinion. And collaboration is a pillar of culturally responsive psychotherapy. So keep that in mind. Um, moving on, try to, try to give direct affirmations. So if someone comes out to you, for example, um, saying that, using the example of, if you're queer, know that I love and support you, instead of sentiments like, I still love you. That word still is still that microaggression that applies, you know, you are different, you are abnormal, but I'm okay with it. So keep that in mind when you talk about these things. Uh, it can subtly reinforce heteronormativity. So also really try to avoid sentiments like, I don't care either way if you're queer. Because again, that's, that's not affirming. Affirming is saying you are queer and I love and support you. Different than I don't care either way, you know, what happens. Is that making sense? Cool. Okay. 
So always remember too, the better way to affirm something is to directly say it, not imply it. So if any of these notions cannot comfortably come out of your mouth as an ally just quite yet, just take some more time to reflect and become comfortable, much like your queer loved one um, have to. So if you're not feeling like a super ally yet, don't worry. But again, always come from a place of active and direct language rather than passively implying things, because that's what being in the closet is all about. It's about passively acknowledging things, secretly acknowledging things, and hiding things. So let's try to decondition this from ourselves. Um, also, one of the big ones, as an ally, you are human. Just like us queer people, we're human too. You're going to make mistakes, microaggressions, and there's going to be moments of hatred. I'm not condoning it, I'm just acknowledging that it's there. So kind of like what I was saying earlier, if, if a queer person experienced, um, or if, if you notice you said something offensive, or if someone calls you out and says, hey, that's homophobic, or that's not very queer affirming, remember, ask concrete retorts. So if someone says, you know, hey, tell me about coming out, it was traumatic, something quick like that. Um, when you notice that you've stepped on someone's toes, Note that the comment can be offensive or hurtful. The number one thing I always hear when someone's called out for being racist, homophobic, et cetera, the first thing is, no, I wasn't, or no, that's not, as if magically speaking it into existence is gonna make it happen. Try to remove that from your vocabulary. If someone calls you out, or if you feel called out for something and it feels like a personal attack, sit with that discomfort. Queer people have had to deal with that for eons, so now you get to taste it. So just simply acknowledging, wow, what I said was hurtful or I didn't know, but thank you for letting me know what I said was offensive are good building blocks for developing good allyship because we're always going to step on each other's toes. Um, also, if you as an ally call somebody out, suggest an alternative. So using the example of someone of a, you know, a bachelorette party and someone asks a queer person, you know, what was coming out like and someone in a wonderful ally does call them out and say, hey, why do you think it was okay to ask something so intimate and personal in this public space right now? You can also suggest an alternative. Be like, I understand um, queer people are amazing and wonderful and very uh, engaging. So I understand why you have this question. Maybe you could have asked it in a more private context or maybe you could have rephrased it like A, B, and C. So suggest an alternative is always a helpful way. And <laughs> Just remember, you're going to trip and fall as an ally. There's still going to be moments where you don't even know you're doing something a bit offensive, or there's a moment where, yeah, maybe you drop the ball, or going back to the example of um, someone being pushed back into the closet with straight acting, the example I used with two business partners uh, checking into a hotel together, and they are viewed as a heterosexual married couple, and let's say you as the allied friend, um, just let it happen or stayed quiet. Yes, that's a moment of submission, but also repetition, repetition, repetition. Life is going to throw more curveballs and more punches, so there will be plenty more opportunities for you to support people. And in those moments where maybe you did let something get a blind eye or you did let something slip under the radar, maybe even acknowledge it to your queer loved one and just say, you know what, in that moment, could I have done something different? That vulnerability goes a long way. Could I have done something different? Or maybe just suggesting, you know what, what would have been like, Bob, if I said this instead? Or are you okay that I remained quiet while that happened? Or are you comfortable with that brief moment of straight passing you had? So these are all some tips. Any questions or comments or anecdotes on this slide? I just have one thought. And I think it's also equally as important for straight allies to give um, their queer friends the space to kind of empower them to use their voice in times of injustice or maybe harassment. So for example, say person A is queer and person B is their friend and they're straight and they go to a bar and say that someone was um, saying either slurs or uh, really prejudiced or stereotypical things to person A. Um, and if person A wants to speak on it and take over the situation themselves, for person B to give them that space to use their voice and use their power to either resolve the conflict or to uh, stand up for it. 
Or right. if person A feels unsafe, I think person B should prioritize person A's preference. So sometimes, a lot of times when queer feel unsafe and uh, unsafe environments, you know, in uh, typically heterosexual environments, whether it's a bar, a social setting, maybe they don't want that confrontation. And what they need from person B is to kind of walk away rather than stand up for them. So I think always asking for permission from uh, for allies, for queer people, what do you need right now? Do you need me to vouch for you? Or do you want to walk away? Um, do you feel unsafe right now rather than kind of um, making that decision for them? Okay, so more of acknowledging there's a fork in the road and using one's ally privilege to present that and let the queer person choose which direction they want to take. That's what it sounds yes, like. That, that, mm-hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Nakash. Uh, also, there's a article just posted in the chat box regarding microaggression. So that's great. Thank you, Nakash, for providing that. She's one of my research assistants. Okay. More on allyship. So this I heard just this past week from a trans client. Remember that transitioning is a process. It's a process that may have taken the individual years to accept psychologically. And and should they choose to physically transition to whatever stage they want to, that's their choice, uh, understand that it's a process. So if someone tells you, hey, you know what? Truly, authentically, I am transgendered. I am a trans woman. And what next Tuesday you expect them to look and pass for a woman like that's understand that it's a transitioning process so give people time space and years to become authentically whoever the heck they are Um, also too uh, I should have put this on the slides um, some feedback I've also heard from trans individuals do not ask about their genitalia first and foremost just don't People don't walk up to you asking how your penis is or how your vagina is. Why do you think you have the right to ask the same thing to someone who's just revealed something intimate about themselves that they identify as transgender? So always keep that in mind. So also, um, one other thing in allyship, strive to understand and support bisexuality. One example I got years ago, it was just from a personal contact, was the analogy that bisexuality is like a fine hotel. A fine hotel is inherently attractive and has many amenities, okay? Many people pass through a fine hotel, but only if you actually live up at the condos up top. And that's the best way I've heard bisexuality described. There, people who are bisexual tend to be the dwellers in the fine hotels condos. They have a residence there. They live there. This is their identity. This is where they stay. Downstairs are when the the passerbys transition in and out of this place. And unfortunately, this is a bit reinforced by the literature because the literature, psych literature, also sometimes refers to bisexuality as a transitional identity. So some people do use it as a transitional identity. For some people, it is their identity for a longer term. So just always make efforts to understand bisexuality because biphobia is becoming one of the more targeted populations within the queer community. It has been the trans community for decades. And now I guess we're making more space for, for biphobia. So that really needs to be squashed in time, guys. Okay. Um, understanding differences between LGBTQ informed work and allyship proper. Um, This was brought up actually this past weekend by a seminar I attended uh, by the speaker, um, uh, well, soon to be Dr. Cross, uh, Aiden Cross. Uh, There is a difference between striving to be an ally and actually being an ally and simply being informed that there are LGBTQ matters that are different from maybe heteronormative matters. So ask yourself, you know, am I going to be LGBTQ informed? meaning I know that there's queer people, I know that they have differences in their life, I know that they may have different experiences than me, and how is this different than allyship where someone is immersing themselves in the community as a guest uh, and really striving to evoke change within the community. So from my, my example of this is there's the difference between tolerance and acceptance. Someone can tolerate your queerness. Someone can accept your queerness. So that's my take, my hot take on that. 
And note that coming out isn't always linear. Queer persons may need support in situations where they're forced and try to pass. So as I've said before, coming out and just living authentically and straight acting may have different buckets. Some people in one circle may be more straight passing or may be out as queer. In another circle, maybe their family, they're not as out. Or maybe within their family, they're out to cousins, but not to immediate family. So just understand authenticity is not linear. So you can't be expecting your queer counterparts like, okay, last month you were out to this person. Last month uh, you were straight passing at this one bar. Next month, where are you going to be? You can't expect things in a linear sequential fashion. Um, and a huge thing, support queer owned businesses as an ally and maybe reconsider spending money at openly LGBTQ corporations. So this can be, again, going back to normalizing the conversation, you're asking to go to, you know, go to grab lunch, some fast food with your friends. Okay, we could go to this queer owned business, that's a mom and pop, or we could go to In-N-Out that donated a whole lot of money to the Trump campaign. And normalizing this in the conversation, just saying, well, this corporation donated to um, conversion therapy in the Midwest. Do we really wanna give our gay money there? That's what I always ask myself. I always say my gay money doesn't need to go to them. So consider this. And plus, if you're wondering what are some queer owned businesses in your local area, just Google it. I remember um, from my practice when I had the option through Yelp and Google reviews to endorse if this was Latinx or um, LGBTQ owned. So, you know, check those boxes. So trust me, there are databases and directories out there of people who have endorsed queer owned businesses. Um, from a affirming stance, we can help support queer businesses. And from a more combative stance, we can hurt anti-queer corporations where it hurts them best, their wallet. Don't give money to causes you don't believe in. It's my opinion. And remember, try to remove from your vocabulary comments such as, oh, you don't look gay, or you don't, you don't present as gay, you don't sound gay. These are not compliments. They're really not. So try to edit them from your vocabulary in time. Any questions or comments on allyship so far? Okay. Hmm. I think I, yeah, I repeated the slide. Okay, so part of allyship and just living authentically and challenging straight passing is receiving resources and promoting resources to others. So I'm just going to be brief. Um, a lot of like the, the work I've digested for my clinical caseload is put into worksheets. So there's a link here for that. And I'll make these slides available after this talk. Um, there are queer organizations. So AIDS Lifecycle, APLE Health and Wellness. I mean, th th this is healthcare for queer people. Cheer Los Angeles, a philanthropic group. And, you know, the list goes on. So receiving these resources is helpful and also just disseminating these to people. That's a great way to be an ally. And that's a great way to challenge straight passing and inauthenticity, actually being in the queer community. Um, national resources are provided here too. And all of these are readily accessible, um, again, at the national level. And my closing thoughts on this, which I'll be able to take questions and facilitate group discussion um, for the people who have stayed around. My closing thoughts are children deserve to be themselves. If they instead realize they're different during a critical time of development, they may develop a false identity to appease others, avoid ostracism, and still get their emotional needs met. Queer kids early on may be forced to develop a keen awareness of their presentation in their daily environment and have to develop a false self tied to sexuality and masculinity slash femininity to receive conditional love and remain physically safe in their environment. Proto-queer kids fortify this straight acting false self to navigate the heteronormative world. Oftentimes, this straight acting persona gets reinforced and this can harm their ability to form meaningful relationships and, oh, it's blocked. <laughs> And I get caught up. This can harm their ability to form meaningful relationships and a solid sense of self. So with that said, here are all of my references with this very aggressive one on top in all caps. 
straight from the literature this all comes from. And I do want to plug my next talk in my Summer Pride series. Uh, the next one is entitled Addictive Habits for LGBTQ Plus Folks, Exploring Dependence on Substances, Spending, and Sex. And we're going to go over the therapy worksheets I've devised to help people explore their relationship to addictive habits. Here's a little QR if people want to take a picture. But again, these slides will be made available after this talk. And here is all my socials if you want to take a picture of this or again, get it off the slides at a later time. Oh, Dr. Bridget, take e. Yes. I um, am on your website right now. I don't see that these are on for the upcoming events. It's coming. Okay. <laughs> yeah, all my energy was to this one. So um, I'm leaving it to everyone who has stuck around. We can go over the straight passing psychotherapy worksheet that everyone who's attended is going to receive a copy of. We can go over that for people's use in clinical work or their personal use. We could also facilitate discussion on these topics. Um, just the straight passing, or not the straight passing, the um, allyship question alone brought up some rich conversation. So I'm going to leave it to you all to let me know what direction you'd like the rest of our time to take. I actually have a question. My name's Kurt. Um, hi, Kurt. hi. I, I'm just curious. I, I had a trip a couple of years ago where I was driving across country and I, I had an experience in Indiana where I, it was the first time I actually, you know, I'm from California. I actually felt sort of unsafe being there, being gay. And I was, you know, and all I was doing, I, you know, I have a little rainbow bracelet that I wear, but it just did not feel safe. And I'm wondering how would you work with a client who, as far as straight acting and code switching, how would you work with a client where they're in an environment where they have to act a certain way in order to just sort of get by day to day, whether that's with their family or where they're from? Mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, first off, and you know, I've had to guide people through this um, a, little, a little too often, especially, yes, when they talk about going to the Midwest and the South. It's trying to highlight the utility of this. So first and foremost, from a resilience and a strengths-based stance, letting them know, wow, you've been able to adopt one more skill set to your day-to-day -day life. So highlighting how it does protect them and also acknowledging that it's kind of sad that they have to adopt this skill set for it. Um, and it's just radically accepting that this may be um, a bit of a performance that they may have to engage in in order to remain safe. Um, the unfortunate truth is we can't remove all of this. We can't remove the situation from the client and we can't, we can highlight and praise how they have been authentic and maybe they are living authentically, but we do have to radically accept that this is an act they're going to have to use temporarily and situationally for a a length of time. Uh, that's part of the less fun parts of my work where you let people know, hey, you're in a situation or it's, it's similar to like a, um, a queer teen who still has to live at home and still has to be in the closet just for them to keep stable housing until they can go and be off on the road. So it's just that unfortunate radical acceptance that this is time limited. This is a skill that you'll be able to use in other dimensions and generalize it out, maybe in the business world or such. And this sounds like it's, uh, it's conditional and time limited. So I would suggest highlighting that. Does that answer your question, Kurt? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's just, I, I think it's such a difficult situation, right? For anybody, you know? And I mean, I, I'm, the, I'm, I'm 45 this year. So it's like when I grew up, it wasn't a, even in California where I'm, it wasn't cute. It wasn't an okay thing when I went to high school, you know, now I'm talking to kids where it's okay, but it's just, uh, yeah, it's just a different, different thing, especially if you're outside of a, if you're in the Midwest or in the South where it's simply not okay anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. It's really tragic. It really is. 
Um, if I also haven't plugged this, if people aren't already a part of my uh, emailing list and want to join it, just feel free to either DM me or just put your email in the chat and I can add you to that list as well. But a lot, a lot of you are already on it. So I think it'd be helpful for us to look into the worksheet and see what that's like. So clinicians can see what it's like to guide someone through it and people who maybe want to use it on their own, uh, non-clinicians can see what it's like. So let me get out of this. All right, and all right. So this is the Use Straight Acting Worksheet. Uh, the title came from just hookup culture and how that phrase is used so often. So it begins by just acknowledging what straight passing is. And as the clinician, I mean, you can definitely expand on it, but it's, it's a way for people to stay safe, maybe receive praise, and also just be inauthentic. And that's something we're trying to decondition and challenge. So my therapy worksheets are a conglomerate of process questions that, have, that I've drawn both from the literature, the research, and also just my clinical work with people. So it begins just point blank asking, you know, when asked, have you ever had to deny your sexuality to someone? Describe the first time this happened, followed by the most significant time this happened. So each one of these prompts can be a couple sessions on their own. Seriously. Um, but I like that this at least is all in one tangible space, either on you know, a digital document or on a, a printout that someone has. So this is probing, does straight passing even exist in their world? Is this something they've had to adopt? And it asks them, again, the first time and one of the most significant times. It may be the same response. And again, it's, it's pretty free form. This is the nature of therapy. So there's no specific correct answer we're looking for. Any questions on that first prompt? Okay. Uh, the next prompt, would you say you've made a persona or alter ego to handle situations where you didn't want your queer identity knowledge, acknowledged or discussed? If so, what would you call this version of yourself? Does it feel like a facet of yourself or does it feel like a persona that really isn't your true self at all? So this allows the person to think about Again, just to acknowledge, you know, wow, is straight passing something I've had to do? Um, more, more often than not, everyone's had some sort of moment of it. It doesn't always have to be a part of their identity, but sometimes it also is. So it allows the, the person reading this, the consumer, to label this. We don't have to call it your straight acting persona, but it allows them to put language to it. And then it allows them to understand, you know, is this just a facet of me or is this how I've been identifying long term? Questions or comments on this prompt? Okay. Next, when did this persona who could pass as straight emerge? Do you remember how old you were? So this is just exploring their history and letting someone understand maybe how insidious this has been in their life, if it in fact takes place. And again, all of this is for someone who is ready to explore this and look at it. Some people got praised for their straight passing, so they don't want to uh, challenge it. They, if it ain't broke, don't fix it for some people. So as always, meet the client where they're at. Up next, currently, how often does this version of yourself come into play, such as in your work or professional context or with family? Is this rare or common? This again appeals to the multifaceted nature of straight acting. Sometimes you are out and proud with your friends, your chosen family. Sometimes you have to be a little more conservative with uh, loved ones or immediate family and the, the business place. I mean, that's a place where often heteronormativity tends to be the norm. And it's good to just look at the different dimensions and the different buckets of people people interact with and how they may shift their identity from place to place where this code switching may come up. The next, does so-called straight acting come with some kind of psychological cost or is it emotionally effortless? Indeed, maybe it's gratifying to do it well. At the same time, there may be negative emotions too because it can be burdensome 
or one may hold resentment for having to do it at all. So it allows someone to, for them to ask themselves, okay, what are the benefits? What have been the costs? And how has this helped me? And how has it maybe hurt me? Moving on. Again, looking at where it stuck itself in someone's life. Have you ever been praised for being straight acting? If so, what was that like for you? Is there sometimes you like it, other times you don't? And does straight acting help to keep you safe? Maybe share a variety of experiences you've had with this. So again, this is, each one of these prompts, again, can be a couple sessions in themselves. So this just explores, again, the multifaceted nature of this. Sometimes people like it, sometimes they don't, and they deserve to explore the spectrum of experiences they've had. Then this gets someone, the next prompt is to get someone to ask themselves, do they value straight passing? So to strangers, do you think you're noticeably queer? Describe your experiences. You're bound to hear different reactions with this. Some people think they're noticeably gay. Some people don't. Some people like that about themselves and some people not so much. The next prompt. Do you value a queer person who is straight acting? Maybe you've heard a variety of reactions. Feel free to share sometimes you valued it a lot. Other times you might have made, it might have made you uncomfortable. Also, what, what one of the researchers in the lab uh, suggested, I actually was advocating for, have there been times when you've been homo negative? Basically, have you ever had to shame a queer person? But that got edited out. But that is definitely able to be explored with this prompt. Because sometimes people have to be a bit homo negative just to pass. If you're passing for straight and you see someone else who's not and getting bullied for it, you know, oftentimes people don't want to join in and join the bullying. So there's those uncomfortable times where people have forced themselves back in the closet and that can be explored with this prompt. Up next, do you feel like straight acting helped preserve an important relationship such as with a parent sibling, friend, or colleague. Again, looking at the grim utility of straight passing and straight acting. And then asking the person again, would you say you could pass for straight? How easy, difficult is this? So this is getting the person's opinion on this. Okay, just checking the chat box. Now, the big one that isn't always explored, so that's why I put it in a sentence here, how do you associate straight acting to masculinity or femininity, if at all? Uh, oftentimes, the continuum of masculine to feminine, it's always implied in a lot of these topics in queer matters, but it's not always overtly asked. So it's asking the person, you know, if you are straight acting, does that mean you're more of a man? Does that mean you're more of a woman, et cetera? Up next, have you ever had to change or alter your voice or manner of speech to hide your sexuality? Describe these experiences and context in which you do it. So this is a prompt because not often people are asked this, but it comes up a lot. Asking people, have you had to lighten your voice, deepen your voice, or just uh, change how you talk as part of this code switching? Up next, what would you say, or would you say you've changed how you walk to hide your sexuality? Is this a part of every day? Where and when does this happen? So this is getting into the behaviors of straight passing. Do you keep to yourself or simply not share important interests or hobbies? Please explain. So again, I was, I was working with a client that wouldn't go see his favorite musical artist because they were highly associated with the queer community and they didn't want to be outed or perceived as gay for attending this. So these are more behaviors or lack of behaviors that people do at straight passing. So this is definitely a heavy topic to explore here. And then up next, 
More than just keeping things to yourself, do you ever say things that are not true as part of this straight acting? If so, give some examples. So it's, it's a nice way of saying, have you had to lie about things in order to keep this persona going? This is where themes of embarrassment and shame may arise. So this is a very heavy prompt right here. Moving on. More free space. So say more on anything you feel needs to be said regarding straight acting. And this is typically where I hear people say, well, I actually like it. Or um, I get praised for it on sex apps. You know, people tell me, oh, I'm masculine presenting and I like that. So these are those things that keep people closeted sometimes. And then last, I have a prompt, which I will just read straight out. <clears throat> this last thought experiment in this exercise may sound abstract. Nevertheless, if you're in the process of acknowledging, accepting, or disclosing your sexuality, you may have to restructure your relationship with this dimension of yourself, or even mourn the death of your straight acting persona in order to move forward. Your straight acting persona may be stunting your growth as a queer person, or it may literally save your life. So again, it's acknowledging both sides of the coin. For example, a straight acting queer person may need to use this persona to keep their job or prevent being assaulted or gay bashed. Another example could be a queer person's parents mourning the loss of a heterosexual child they never truly had. When we begin to acknowledge, affirm, accept, and change our thoughts on our sexuality, we're asking our loved ones to do the same. This is okay, and you're not burdening anyone by living more authentically. Unfortunately, I often hear clients gaslit into believing their sexuality hurts someone else's feelings. Nice try, but nope. Describe your reactions to this concept and then maybe begin to list steps you can take to begin restructuring or mourning the death of your straight acting persona. Remember that you are good, you are lovable, and everything will be okay. So this is a prompt and then it's a nice big blank space for people to reflect on this. But at the end of the day, my intention with clients is to get them to rid themselves of the straight acting persona um, indefinitely with the exception that there are going to be moments where other people try to bring this out of you. But as long as one has mourned this, accepted it, or accepted that it was there, understood its utility, and then let it pass from their identity, that is where I've typically seen people flourish in their lives, live authentically, and just be happy or be less miserable. So that's what the digest of this research topic, this talk, and this subsequent psychotherapy worksheet came about from. So that is that. All right, everybody. Y'all made it through this heavy, yet in my opinion, necessary topic. Um, I wanna thank everyone for sitting through all of this, hopefully absorbing knowledge, I wanna thank everybody for their funny and uh, just helpful and heartfelt um, additions to this talk. If people have any other questions or anything they wanna explore or process here, please feel free. We still do have some time. And I don't also, at the same time, I don't want people feeling bound to this. If you have other obligations or things you need to do, I completely understand if you need to go. And again, if you want to be informed on my next talk in two weeks or just other events coming from my practice and my office, feel free to leave your info and you can DM me or just leave it in the chat box. Just leave your email or the best way to reach you. 